No matter what percentage of equity you own, whether you own 1% or 50% or 80%, work like you own 100% of it. I found that the partnerships where people aren't keeping track of points, meaning, well, I only own 33%, so I'm gonna do 33% of the work and I expect this guy to do the other 66. Those partnerships never work out. No matter what you own, if you're in a partnership, go all in and pretend like you own 100%, and assuming your partner does their part too, it will be a fruitful partnership. Welcome to the Fitness CEO Podcast. Hey friends, welcome back to another month of an amazing episode here at the Fitness CEO Podcast. If you're new to the show, my name is Bryce Henson. I'm your host, your Fitness CEO, and I'm here with my man, my business partner, mentor, and friend, Mr. Bedros Koulian. Hello. And uh, if you're new, he's uh, on on a monthly basis where we get to dialogue, riff a bit, and I can unpack uh, some of his thoughts. So today we're going to be covering a big topic that's always asked, especially with new franchise partners coming through the system. I have a partner or a potential partner. I'm just curious, Bryce, mm. you know, should I partner with this particular person? So today's episode is really unpacking you know, successful partnerships, unsuccessful partnership, and maybe unpacking or unveiling the kimono a little bit and giving some insight in sure. terms of our experiences. So yeah. to kick it off, I guess um, I'm curious, be high level, you know, why partnerships, some succeed, some fail from your from your lens. And then yeah. I really want you to take us back starting Fitbody and you had a partnership and, you know, curious and some learning lessons mm -hmm. about that process. Yeah. So, I mean, we can't say the partnerships don't work because you look at Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. I mean, they had an amazing lifelong partnership. Charlie Munger just passed away yeah. days away from being a hundred years old. Yeah. Warren Buffett is as old as time and still sharp as a tack uh, and brilliant. And again, they had a wonderful partnership, but the reason it works so well is each of them brought something very unique and special to that relationship, to that business partnership. And when a partnership does not work, in my experience, and this is 22 years of entrepreneurial experience, and I've had partners across many different businesses and other businesses I've started without partners. And others I've started with partners and ended up as a solopreneur on my own when the partner and I parted ways, such as Fit Body Bootcamp, yeah. right? Many people don't know that that the beginning of Fit Body Bootcamp, uh, I started off as a partnership. And um, before we get there, though, the reason I believe partnerships do fall apart is because the partners are not equally yoked. And it's either because they're not equally yoked, as in they're both not bringing an equal amount of value to the relationship, and so soon one or the other is going to get resentment and likely demand that they part ways or restructure the partnership. I've seen this happen in my companies and I've seen this happen in companies of people that I coach and consult and friends that own big multi-million dollar companies as well. Uh, so one, it's not because they're equally yoked. Um, and, and two, it's because they don't have an outline, which is what's known as an operating agreement of who's going to be the chef can't have two chefs in the kitchen. You've got to have one chef and the other partner has to be able to kind of defer to that chef. That's just, there has to be a chef in the kitchen. You can't have two chefs in the kitchen. Otherwise the food doesn't quite work out. So that's kind of been my experience. Um, now when you I'll unpack the fit body bootcamp experience, yeah. uh, my partner and I back in 2000 and early 2010, maybe even late 2009, thought of this idea of taking the outdoor boot camp, bringing it indoors, and making that work as a 30-minute group training model, right? Uh, and he is a amazing marketer, uh, hilarious as the day is long. No one's made me laugh as hard as him. Uh, magnanimous in terms of this magnetic, huge, large-in-life personality. Just a great dude, Right? And so those are the things he had going for them. I, on the other hand, I'm very deliberate and decisive in how I operate. Uh, if we say we're going to do something by a specific due date, it will get done. Mm -hmm. And it'll, I'll either, either give it to you ahead of time or on the due date, and it'll exceed your expectations. And he didn't necessarily operate by those protocols. He was like, well, we'll get it done in another week. Or he's just pressed against the deadlines. Or... When he got it done, you can tell it was last minute and there might have been a lot of spelling errors or not necessarily exactly as we talked about. The product was not what we promised. And so when I started seeing a lot of pattern of that, I'm very judicial and deliberate and decisive. 
uh, he, while a great marketer, was very, I guess, airy-fairy in the way he approached entrepreneurship and the way he approached leadership. I led our people, and I was not a great leader back then, not to the level that I am now, but I was still preferred by our employees, by our team, over him. And in fact, many employees came to me and said, I think I'm going to resign if I'm still going to be under his jurisdiction for the next you know, month, six months, year to come. And so that kind of put my feet to the fire, like, okay, we don't see eye to eye. We're not equally yoked in terms of how we want this product to look. Deadlines aren't being met. Expectations aren't being met. And on top of that, our employees and a small handful of franchisees were not necessarily happy with the way he was leading the brand along. And at the end of the day, your franchisees and you carry the same flag, Fit Body Bootcamp, right? And so if you are not happy with one of your two leaders, that's a 50% dissatisfaction rate. <laughs> and so I had to have that conversation with him that, hey, buddy, either we have to part ways. Either you go away and, and I'll buy you out or I'll go away and you buy me out. Uh, we both thought about it for a couple of days and then came back together. Um, and, and he felt the same way. At this point, there was so much water under the bridge. There was so much tension between us. And what I'm not really haven't mentioned here, and I think it's worth mentioning. And again, let me just reinforce that he, he's, he's a good guy, has great intentions and funny as heck. And he's a great marketer and even a great entrepreneur. I, I think just as the brand got bigger and the expectations got more specific in terms of deadlines and standards, he was unable to meet those deadlines and standards and expectations. Like, I get it. Not everyone's cut out for that, you know? And so he felt the tension on his side too. So there was tension. There was this passive aggressive relationship that we had. All of a sudden we weren't as friendly as we used to be. And we had that conversation. And after a couple of days of both of us thinking about it, he came to me and said, well, I talked to a few of the employees, and we didn't have the number of employees that we have today. He said, after talking to a few of the employees, um, they said that if I take over, as in him, if he takes over the brand and I leave, that they would quit. He goes, so knowing that, why am I going to buy a business where more than half the employees are going to quit? Probably said, not a good idea. Not a good idea. I said, oh, you have a good point. And I certainly didn't have the money to buy him out for the dollar amount that we agreed upon would be to buy out his half. So I said, do you mind then if I'm going to buy you out, I have to pay you over a period of time. And so we created a structure of like what the price would be that I would buy him out for and what the terms would be over how much time. Um, and that he and his family would get health benefits for a period of time. So there's always, you know, here's a good little side lesson. Anytime you're selling a business, buying out a partner, et cetera, you have to come up with price first terms second. And so we came up with a price and then we came up with terms that worked for my finances because I was financially struggling. I was putting every penny I had back into growing Fit Body Bootcamp. And about what year was this roughly? This was probably 20, late 2012, 2013. Okay. 2013 probably, early yeah. 2013, yeah. And so, um, man, it was, uh, it was pretty scary. So now I took on another debt, right, because I'm paying him monthly payments for a period of time. Uh, but that also lights a new fire under you. And so I realized now looking back, well, why did we partner up? We both liked each other. We, we had a working relationship because he had hired me as a business coach sometime earlier to help him with his gym and get his gym operational again, profitable again, and help it scale, which I did. That's what I do. I, I'm a business coach. Uh, and then we hit it off so well and became friends and that – this idea of Fit Body Boot Camp came along post the housing market crash, right? So now it's like, well, people are, are broke. They can't afford one-on-one -on -one personal training anymore. Um, we're on the other side of 2008 housing market crash. Unemployment is high. And so what if we took the outdoor boot camp, brought it indoors, and tested it out and see if this works? And so we opened up a couple of our own locations inside of gymnastic centers, mm -hmm. which is why the flooring, by the way, if you're a Fit Body Boot Camp client, or you're a Fit Body Bootcamp owner and you're like, this flooring looks very similar. If it was blue, it would look very similar to the inside of a gymnastic center that I take my kids to. That is because we opened up our two, first two locations inside of a gymnastic center. We ran the bootcamp sessions during the hours that they didn't have any clients, any students coming in. And we wanted to prove the indoor concept. And we did. 
And then we ultimately ended up leasing our own locations, but we kept that carpet bonded foam flooring as our nod, I guess, to our heritage of where we came from, which was initially founded in gymnastic centers. Yeah, and it functionally works extremely well. And it works well. well. You know, yeah. uh, very it's antimicrobial. Mm -hmm. it served, you, you don't have to put a, uh, an exercise mat on the ground anymore. It's super soft. Easy on carpeted. the knees, the joints. Yeah, sliders yeah. slide on it. So it was already almost designed for us. Yep. We just didn't know that it it was designed for us until we ran into it, <laughs> right? So you think about it. If, it was, if, if we had opened up in a cheer center, my running joke is like, if we had opened up in a cheer center where it was like all hardwood floors, Fit Body Boot Camp might be operating out of a hardwood. <laughs> we'd be installing hardwood floors, which would be yeah, a different story. Dicey, yeah. But, you know, looking back now, Bryce, I, I can tell you that it's not like we, we literally got into the business partnership because we liked each other and we enjoyed spending time together. We're, we, we became friends, right? That's not a good enough reason. Right. That is not a good enough reason. If, let's say, I brought a concept of, let's say, leadership and processes and systems, but I'm like, man, I don't have the money to scale this thing. And then he's like, you know what? My uncle just died and I got $3 million in inheritance and I'm bringing in money. We're both bringing in something, two very different things mm -hmm. of high value. value. Now he brings in money. I bring in operations, leadership, and systems. And then we were, if we were actually smart enough and created an operating agreement that said, all right, this is the lane that you play in. As the guy that brought in the money, you oversee finances, you oversee revenue, you oversee profits, you oversee how we spend the money. I will oversee the people and the product. Man, it would have been a great, great relationship, assuming that we both did our job. Right. Right. If deadlines weren't met, expectations weren't met, standards weren't set, then we'd be back to the same place. And so we really should never have become business partners. We did. The lesson was learned. We moved on. And I've seen business partnerships thrive uh, because they both brought valuable things to the table, myself and Craig Ballantyne being one of them. For years, we've been business partners. Actually, let's unpack that a little bit because we've had Craig on the show a couple times. Yeah. Actually, we just released an episode a month or so ago. Um, if you were to break down you and Craig, okay, what deliverables do you bring to the table? And I guess what are the opposing value adds you bring to the table? Yeah, so, so I will bring in the structure in terms of my team will set up the masterminds, the workshops, the big live events, et cetera. Craig is very well connected. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit of a, for as much as a recluse that he is, he is a great networker. Totally. Yeah, so it's like a dichotomy. It is. It's such a dichotomy. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I am not, I'm more connected now these days. And I can actually thank two people, Craig Ballantyne and Joe Polish. They've introduced, they opened, opened up more doors and introduced me to, forced introduced me to more people than I would have wanted to be introduced to. And today I have a big Rolodex network oh, yeah. of people because of those two guys. And then Craig would bring the speakers, the, the, he just, he would get all the right people to promote our event, to fill up the seats, et cetera. And so we both brought in such great value. He didn't have a team and he didn't want to lead and manage a team that's going to help set up the food and banquet order, what mm -hmm. hotel is this going to be at, how much is it going to cost, and who's going to... Uh, run the schedule. My team did all that. Uh, I wrote the sales copy for whatever event that we were running. And then he was just so well connected that he had the people, as in the talent, mm -hmm. that he can get up on stage. And then he had a relation. He had built such relationship equity with those people that he could ask them to promote our events, whether they were workshops, masterminds, multi-day seminars, and they would promote it, of course, for a commission, right? Sure. With an affiliate link, and they would help fill up the seats, you know, a thousand people, 1,500 people at a live event. And so they talk about a symbiotic relationship. And then whenever a decision needed to be made, he was just kind enough to say, I defer to you. And he just goes, hey, big bro, I defer to you. And so, therefore, if Joan's like, hey, uh, do you guys want to do this next event in Miami or Las Vegas? I don't have to have her text or reach out to Craig. I don't have to reach out to him myself. I just go, you know what? Do Miami or do Las Vegas. Whatever works for us. Like, whatever works for me, I know Craig is copacetic with it. Well, and that's because that's your operating agreements. You right. Know, you knew this going in. This is basically exactly. our means of accountability. Exactly. And, but it's like you have to fall on your face in that first relationship to be able to be able to show up differently in the second relationship. Uh, same with the business partnership you and I have today. Yeah. Like we have our lanes and we stay in them and we do well with it and we complement each other where necessary. And um, I mean, for how little we communicate compared to how quickly the Fit Body Bootcamp brand continues to grow, 
Like some people go, well, that's a miracle. That's all you talk to Bryce. I'm like, there's some days I'll see him and he'll see me, but we don't say a word, mm -hmm. but we might exchange a text uh, or not. Uh, but we have our lanes and we know what the standards and expectations are. And if you say, B, I'm going to do this thing, then I just consider it done. There's no open loop in my head. Likewise. And same here. And so, but again, we had to, I'm sure you can list off relationships, business partnerships that you were in that were not as copacetic which then helped you go, oh, these are the I's I need to get dotted and T's I need to get crossed before I go into this relationship. And that's what it is. It's a, it's a marriage. It's a marriage. And if there's a 56% divorce rate in marriages, well, and that's supposed to be like in the eyes of God, in front of God, till death do us part. We say those words. I don't recall saying till death do us part in any business partnership. Nope. Which is why there's a higher divorce rate in business partnerships. So if it's a relationship, what if we could all put our best foot forward with operating agreement, with expectations, both be equally yoked, bring something unique and different, and then you know have the, okay, well, this guy's going to defer to that guy because we do need a tiebreaker and we can't have two chefs in one kitchen. When all those things happen, it becomes a beautiful symphony uh, that you see like Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. Yeah, amen to that. Now, in that particular example, you know, when you're forging partnerships, um, it has to have also emotional toll, not just from a business perspective, but your personal perspective, your family, you know, speaking of marriage, et cetera. And that's what really business partnerships were. Yeah. When you were going through that, you know, challenging breakup, if you will, with your initial partnership, what did that look like from a familial perspective, relationship perspective? And I just asked the question because that's, you know, the reality of business. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important for our audience to just kind of think that through on the back end. Yeah, and I'm so glad you brought that up because when you go into a business partnership, what you're really doing is you're bringing your spouse and your kids into that business partnership too. Yeah, Your family is going into that business partnership too. And sometimes we're like, oh, I can keep this silo different than that silo. You can't because when Fit Body Bootcamp was struggling in the beginning and I had to put more money into it, and my partner at the time didn't have as much money, even though we were 50-50 partners because we shook hands and agreed. But then, as you know, there was no operating agreement that said if we need to put money in, we both need to put in equally. If not, if I need to put more in, then my stock increases, my equity increases. There, there was none of that verbiage. And so you could imagine as I put more money in and he was unable to, now my wife was like um, – how much more money are we going to put in without our partner putting in more money? Like, do you think that's fair? Why should he own 50%? Don't you think it's not fair to us? She was right on every point. But of course, now you feel like, well, hey, don't worry, it's going to work out and then he'll be able to put in his money or we'll take our money back out first before we do split profit share. But then inevitably something goes wrong because that's how business is. You plan for the best and then... You know, it just things happen, right? Marketing takes longer than expected. Sales take are more complex than Facebook desired. Shuts down your ads. A million life, freaking business. Yeah. The bear freaking the bear comes shows to up. Tack. Yeah, the bear shows up, and so when it does, and you're putting more money in, and now your spouse is like, "Hey, yeah, we had this conversation the last time you put money in. Now I feel like we should own a larger share of the brand, but we don't, and so now you're having to fight a battle on both fronts, right? And gosh, I didn't get a business partner just so I can go to battle on this uh, family side of the, the the ledger, right? And for rightfully so. Like if my wife is freaking out, it's because she's seeing me transfer money from the family bank account to the yeah. company bank account and the company's not making any money. Yeah. My business partner is not putting his equal share into it. I'm saying that's okay. Don't worry. It'll work out and I'll take my money out when we make more profit, being optimistic. But let's face it, wouldn't it be smart had he put money in as well, and that way he had the equal share of skin in the game, right? So all those things end up stressing out a relationship with your spouse, with your kids, and you don't show up as your best self. And you want to talk about stressing out a relationship? The relationship you have with yourself. Those were the years that I was, I put on weight again. I was most stressed, and I had that big, massive panic attack that I ended up writing about it in my book. The chapter was called The Morning of My Heart Attack because it was such a big panic attack, I thought I was having a heart attack. Let's do a little TV timeout, and I would love for you to kind of tee up, but just a high-level version of that story in case our audience hasn't yeah. uh, heard. And the reason that is, I mean, these are just like visceral things that your body is like going through trauma, if right. you will, if you don't handle things and, you know, structure things on the front end, you know, correctly. So 
I want to give you a little space uh, to enlighten the audience. On yeah, that. yeah. So, so, and I'm glad we're doing this because th- this will dovetail in perfectly with the partnership. Um, there was a time right before my big panic attack that I had that my friend, my business partner, drove a Corvette, beautiful Corvette, and you know, Corvette, loud engine. You could hear it coming up, and we, we were renting the old place. Uh, angry attorney. Yeah, or from an angry divorce <laughs> attorney that we were renting space from. And so the walls were thin, and I could hear his Corvette driving up every morning, and my chest would tighten, my throat would close a little bit, my heart would start racing. I would have these, this like anxiety feeling. It wasn't an anxiety attack, but I would feel anxious mm-hmm. hearing his Corvette. Like Pavlov's dog, I was conditioned that I would hear his Corvette. By this point, I had built so much resentment towards him right? And it was my fault. I should have had the conversation and communication with him six months earlier, eight months earlier, but I didn't. And so that was my fault. And so I would hear his Corvette drive up and my body would respond with a stress response. I would feel anxious. And then you fast forward another year. And of course, there I am on a Monday morning. I I go to my guest house, I left a pair of shoes up there the night before. I, I play the drums and I have my drum set in my guest house. Um, you still playing, by the way? I do. I do. Yeah, I've been playing the drums since I was two and a half years old. No joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All oh. types. Hand percussions, drumsticks, you name it. So my drum set was in the guest house. Sunday night, I went and played the drums. I played barefoot, so I had taken my shoes off. Then barefoot, I walked across the pool deck that night. Monday morning, I'm looking for my shoes. I can't find it. I remembered. It's in the guest house from the night before. As I go upstairs to the guest house, across the pool deck, I bend over and pick up my shoes in the uh, spare bedroom where that Trump said is, all of a sudden my chest tightens up, my throat closes, my heart's beating rapidly, I go tunnel vision, profusely sweating, Bryce. I'm like, holy hell, both arms start tingling, and I'm like, I am having a heart attack. This was 11 years ago, I'm 49 now, I was 38 then. 38 years young. 38 years young, man, and I'm like, I'm having a heart attack, and all I remember thinking was, Diana and the kids cannot find me here tonight, dead. They think I left for work. They're going to realize at night I didn't come home. They're going to search everywhere. By the time they search the guest house and find me, it's going to be late at night. I just imagined in my head my body's going to just be ugly and bloated, right? And they're going to have this most traumatic scene of dad dead in the most ugly estate. This is what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thought that ran through my head was I felt so sad for Andrew and Chloe. Back then there were puppies. Andrew's now 18, Chloe's 16. So you go back 11 years, um, you know, Andrew was nine, Chloe was seven, yeah. right? And I remember thinking to myself, who's going to walk Chloe down the aisle? That was my job. And then who's going to teach Andrew to be a modern day knight? Because I'd read that book. Remember you came out to his um, right rite of passage, passage experience yeah, when he turned 13? Up in Idaho, yeah. to a boys trip. Good on you, man. Yeah. That was an awesome experience. Yeah. I was like, who's going to run that for him? Who's going to teach him how to be a modern day knight? Like I, want, I had this plan of having a group of men that I trust and look up to be there mentoring my son that day. And so I was just this heavy sadness of I'm letting my kids, my family down. And, and, and so my <laughs> I didn't once think like I'm dying and I'm scared. I just didn't, didn't cross my mind. But I didn't want them to find me dead in that state. So I figured if I could just somehow stumble down the staircase and if I were to die on the pool deck, my wife can look out the glass window and because you could see the pool out the kitchen window and she'd be like, oh my God, look, my husband's dead or on the ground and they'd find me in a less horrific state, right? And it wouldn't be so ugly Mm -hmm. to see. That wasn't what ran through my head. Of course, as I stumbled down the staircase, I don't know if it was just the movement, it was the fresh air from the outside, but all of a sudden, all those symptoms started to wash over me, and I just am panting, and my heart's slowing down in terms of racing, and I'm just in a sweaty mess, but otherwise, I'm fine. In my head, I go, holy hell, I just dodged a heart attack, and of course, had my shoes in hand, so gotta go, gotta go to work. (laughs) Gotta build the empire, (laughs) baby. Right, gotta go to work. Of course, you know, the next day, I went to the doctor, and they did a stress test on the heart and said, your heart's fine, but it seems like you had a panic attack. And, you know, that, that was the beginning of realizing that I was burning the candle on both ends. And if it's possible to burn it in the middle, I was doing that too. And it finally had caught up to me. And so, you know, when I say a bad partnership can have a 
not only a, a negative relationship or outcome on the business, but also on your family, but also on the relationship that you have with yourself. I started to emotionally eat because I am an emotional eater. So I'd come home and I would stress eat at night, bagels and cream cheese. That adds on a lot of calories very quickly. Mm-hmm. So I'm eating bagels and cream cheese at night, putting on weight, unhappy with my body, not feeling like I want to go work out the next day because I have too much work to do to try and dig the company out of this deficit that we're in. And of course, my relationship with my family is suffering. My relationship with myself is suffering. My relationship with the business is suffering. Uh, and of course, what do we do? We point, it was his fault. Well, who agreed to that partnership? I did. Who didn't make an operating agreement? I didn't. I didn't know about one, but I should have maybe done a little Google search. How do you enter a business partnership with someone? I'm sure Google would have spit out some bullet points that I could have used, right? Yeah. And so it was uh, It was definitely a, a learning experience. You know, we have a lot of Navy SEAL friends in common, uh, Jason Redman being one of them. And the SEALs say that some of their best lessons are written in blood. Ooh, I don't think I've heard Jay say that. What do you yeah. mean by that? Or what does he mean by well, that? Well, you know, they, they had this thing back when the war first kicked off, the war on terror, back in early 2001, 2002. The SEALs would just like attack, charge into a room and just try and find all the bad guys and kill them, right? They knew that was a target house full of bad guys who were terrorists and, you know, trying to blow up American coalition forces. And, of course, you run into a room and if they're prepared for you to come, they're going to shoot back. And they were having a lot of casualties. And they learned these lessons in blood that maybe we don't have to charge into the room like we used to. Maybe there's a better way. Maybe there's a better way. Maybe we can pick a lock. Maybe, just maybe, one guy, apparently, Jay told me a story of one guy turned the knob on the door and the door just opened. As it turns out, in the Middle East, they don't lock their doors. And so they didn't have to use explosives to blow up the door and therefore warn the people inside that they're coming. They didn't have to kick the door down and then charge in. More often than not, they can just quietly turn the knob methodically flow through the house, more often than not, wake up the bad guy from a sleeping state and not get shot. But those lessons were learned in blood. They had to get shot, get killed, spill blood to learn those lessons. In business, the blood that we shed is money. I can't tell you how many lessons I've learned that no MBA, Harvard, Yale education could provide. It's just learned and lost money. You bleed out money and you learn those lessons like we did in 2020 during the pandemic. Like what, what could Harvard, Yale, or any kind of business school teach about how to handle a business and keep thriving and growing through a pandemic? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. We figured it out, but we probably, not probably, we lost millions of dollars in that one year in the process. Oh yeah. Um, and so we bleed money. They bleed blood. The outcome is oftentimes the same. Uh, if you don't, if you don't die from it, you will learn from it. Full circle, man. Well, this uh, it's a big co- topic. Um, like I said, many of our franchise partners come through and they sync up with partners. Partners, I certainly have. Um, some of my experiences be I've had three um, partnerships that I would consider, you know, um, in my life. And uh, two have been unfortunately not successful and three have. You know, one has been with you and I and you talked about, you know, having um, opposite type of skill sets. It's interesting from my perspective, we're both hard charging, we have the same values. We also have the same skill set around influence. Uh, you gravitate, I think, is naturally, you know, a factory installed more of an, a persuasion of a marketing lens. And I naturally have a more of a leadership structure base if you approach. But when you look at the coin in terms of us mm-hmm. uh, dominating and working together, it works really well because yeah. we bring the same value but different uh, opposing skill sets to basically attack and build the empire. Yeah. Um, same with my brother Barrett. You know, when we launched a location in Michigan, one of the, in Fit Body Boot Camp back in this before uh, the pandemic in 2017, 2018, before you actually reached out and made me the offer of the VP role, had just launched my fourth or fifth location at the time. And my brother Barrett, I mean, same thing, strong value, strong mindset there. And then he executes really, really strongly from a coaching perspective. And then I can bring the sales, the marketing, the leadership perspective. Mm-hmm. He's an incredible leader in his own right. But again, very, you know, opposing type of skill sets, different value points that we yeah. brought to the table. When I look at uh, a couple of the misses, um, one was actually with a family member. My, I love her dearly, but uh, unfortunately, just outside issues, uh, a personal issue kind of brought, brought to the table. So I think one of my big calls to action is you need to really understand and know your partner really, yeah. really well. 
way more than just surface level, okay, just because you get along with each other, you should know them, you know, in a deep, deep, deep foundational level. And uh, certainly, I just didn't have visibility to that. And unfortunately, she's an incredible soul. She executes extremely well, was able to build this incredible culture. But unfortunately, some unknown issues to me at the time ended up making her unaccountable. And that was one point of friction yeah. that really led to a, a severed partnership. Uh, the other one, it was interesting. Um, we didn't bring opposing skill sets. I think, if anything, uh, the partner, he was a former client of mine in my first location, and good good soul. Um, he was also married to his wife, uh, clearly, as you'd imagine. And uh, they were clients in my lo uh, first location, ended up launching uh, another location, and they asked me to partner with them. And I was able to provide the structure, the accountability, and really just you know the vision on how to launch yeah. this thing. And it wasn't, it, it didn't end badly, but in fact, after about a year of time, once they kind of, you know, got an understanding of how I ran the business, the structure I laid, they were able to model that and then, you know, ended up buying me uh, my shares out. So overall that worked out or it, it, uh, it ended okay. And those were kind of a couple looks at my, you know, experiences and what I would have done differently, um, probably number one, just, you know, spending more time and focus uh, and making sure that we were, were bringing different skill sets. It wasn't just leveraging my initial mm -hmm. skill set. And I think that would have probably been, you know, set us up for a longer uh, term relationship. And then secondarily, just, you know, knowing my other business partner more and really looking around the corners and making sure that I had a full understanding right. of the big picture or what's, what was a, uh, behind the curtain, if you will. And I think that's just good business advice. You know, if uh, someone's listening to this right now and potentially looking for a partner, their partnerships can be great, but they're also, they can add complexity as well. And it's just important that you uh, really make sure you know who you're getting involved with. And also too, you can bring those, you know, opposite type skill sets to the table. Yeah. You make such a valuable point here because when you're getting into a partnership, I mean, heck, we could say this for a marriage as well, but when you're getting into a business partnership, you're kind of, you're also partnering up with their shortcomings, their vices. Yeah. Their vices. If there's any addictions, uh, you're partnering with their spouse because if their spouse now becomes someone that stresses them out, you know, irritates them, that stressed out, irritated business partner is going to bring that energy into the business mm -hmm. and you're going to feel it. Oh, the business yeah. is going to feel it. Your team's going to feel it. The clients and customers will feel it. Um, there's so much to be said about really methodically picking and choosing your partner and really seeing, are they married to crazy? Uh, is there any red flags that you need to look out for? Uh, my new rule of thumb is if I, if I don't know them and their spouse for at least 12 months, I'm not going to partner with them. The reason is these days, because of my podcast, because I can get on stage and speak, you meet someone and like, hey, man, I run a $20 million business and I was just moved by your speech. Like, I got this great idea and you exchange numbers and within two weeks, you're like, you guys are texting. You're like, dude, we should start a business together. We should, we should joint venture on this thing. And oftentimes that is not going to work out. I don't know if he's married to crazy. He doesn't know if I'm married to crazy. Right. They don't know what, what my work ethic is or what their work ethic is. Expectations, standards, we don't know. But if I've known you for 12 months, I've seen you in four different seasons I see how you handle things. Life will bring, you know, hardships over that 12-month period, and I'll see how you handle stress, how you hand, handle fame, how you handle poor communication, good communication. Hopefully I've gone out to dinner with you and your significant other a few times, and I've seen how that relationship is. I see how you handle your alcohol, et cetera, and then I might make a decision. So for me, it's become a much slower process in vetting out a partner if there's going to be one. Uh, but for that reason, it's also why I haven't had this issue for over a decade now. Like all the stories that I've told you about things not working out. Uh, and I could go, have gone even businesses that I started before Fit Body Boot Camp where business partnerships didn't work out. Uh, but it's been well over a decade since I've had a bad partner relationship. And it's because of this vetting out process that I've done. It's not, it's not perfect by any means but it's pretty damn close. I mean, look at just you and I as an example. You know, I met you back in 2012 and i um, super grateful for this day, man. It's been such an awesome ride and journey. Yeah. Um, it wasn't until 2018 uh, that you reached out to me and had this vision and kind of put that, yeah. you know, in my ear uh, before we, you know, partnered on, on another level. And at that point, you know, we'd known each other for six years. You'd see me in a lot of different, you know, ways. I joined many of your masterminds. I mean, we've been, you know, in rooms together for, you know, once a quarter for, you know, that six year, yeah. you know, span. So I think, you know, that just 
adds more credibility to what you just laid out in real time, just, you know, as we're sitting mm -hmm. each other right now. Yeah, so. that's exactly right. So on that, uh, on that note, my dude, as we kind of bring out uh, or finish out, I'm curious uh, what your parting piece of wisdoms will be just generally on everything that we, we discussed around partnerships for me. Um, you know, my three kind of takeaways for our audience is number one, partnerships can be great, but only partner if you must. Yeah. Okay. Number two, clear expectations and account on accountability in writing is mission critical. And number three, we talked about this. You need to be able to bring opposing skill sets uh, to the table. And that really, for me, is uh, the fabric of a really strong uh, partnership. Uh, from your perspective, once you close this out. Yeah, I, I think I share all of those. Uh, plus this one more, which is no matter what percentage of equity you own, whether you own 1% or 50% or 80%, work like you own 100% of it. And I found that the partnerships where people aren't keeping track of points, meaning, well, I only own 33%, so I'm going to do 33% of the work, and I expect this guy to do the other 66 those partnerships never work out. No matter what you own, if you're in a partnership, go all in and pretend like you own 100%. Amen. And assuming your partner does their part too, it will be a fruitful partnership. Mic drop, and that's how we're going to finish off today. So, my friend, I know you got a lot of value. My one ask is share this with someone in need that would really help us uh, continue to add more value to you. B, appreciate you, my dude. We'll see you, Thank you next month. And friends, as a reminder, no one is coming to save you. You must save yourself, and the time is now. Thank you, and we'll see you in the next episode.